<laughs> Very good. Cool. So, Michael, are you okay that we are recording this interview today? Yeah, go go for it. Very cool. good. And are you and are you okay that this session is being shared on the blog and snippets of it on social media um, uh, with inspiring quotes from yourself? Lot, yes. I hope they're very inspiring. Very good. I hope so too. Um, cool. Yeah. So before we get started with today's show, let me quickly introduce our sponsor, PathMonk. So if you have enough visitors on your website, but too little of them are actually signing up for a demo or a trial, then you face what a lot of SaaS businesses are facing. Only 2% or less of your website visitors leave contact information on your site to set up a demo. That's what PathMonk fixes. It increases your website conversion rate by around 40% or more. It provides you with more leads from your own website for your business. It's a simple 30 second uh, setup and you get more value from your existing website traffic. Cool. So welcome to the show, guys. Hey there, business owners, directors, and marketeers. Today, I'm meeting Michael McCarty from Inkit, and uh, we're going to talk all about this very interesting product that, that they're working on over there. I'm Lucas, your host, as always. Um, and a little bit about Michael. He's a founder and CEO of Inkit. It's a SaaS solution that enables companies of all sizes to efficiently and intelligently communicate with their customers using printed personalized email, which I think is super, super interesting since the mailboxes are getting fuller and fuller and fuller online going the other way around might be a very very interesting approach um his background uh, uh i think with a lot of investment banking companies he's a timberwolves fan as well so michael welcome to the show thanks appreciate it thanks for having me lucas cool tell us about inkit a little bit more what is it all about yeah so from a very high level inkit is a direct mail automation platform so we make it easy for companies to connect offline mail with their crm so that based on an action or an event, a company can send a one-to-one -one mailer to that customer offline. Those could be things like a bill, it could be a statement, it could be a notice, maybe it's from your telecom company, your insurer, your financial provider, or it could even be a marketing piece too as well. Gotcha, very curious. What are the use cases that you would usually see because the use cases sound a bit different, right? The marketing use case versus, versus the billings. So there's, there's really two big use cases. The first is the marketing use case. So the marketing use case could be broken out into even like smaller sub use cases like loyalty mm -hmm. or abandoned carts or people who have hit a website but haven't come back. So doing like a, an IP or even an email to reverse a pen lookup mm -hmm. as well as just taking inactive users and reactivating people who haven't purchased from you in a number of months. Yep. So that's the marketing bucket. And then the second bucket is more of an operational use case or what we call transactional. And those could be things like sending out your insurance notice from your favorite insurance provider, like such as Allianz, or it could be a bank statement or a different type of notice from your power or utility company. So we also facilitate a lot of the transactional side too, which is also programmatic from the standpoint of it can be set up based on actions or events. Makes total sense. How would you describe the people that benefit the most from your services? What types of teams are usually working with? Is there champions that you usually have in the companies that push for, let's say, um, direct mail marketing again? How should I, how should we imagine yeah. a typical user? So a typical user can be broken on the marketing side into one or two people. You have people who the first category are those who are already using direct mail. And those are typically like a print buyer or a senior print manager. And they're really looking for a way to streamline their operations because they've been doing everything by hand, meaning our solution is able to automate it. The second buyer is a brand new person who's new to print. And typically that audience has experienced some sort of stagnation where their online advertising is starting to to sort of cliff off and they're not seeing the results that they once were with their digital spend. So they view this as a really, really hyper efficient and again, automated way to plug this in. So we see a lot of CRM as well as growth buyers on that side. Yep. Sounds super interesting. How would this type of diff the different types of users that you described there, how would they actually end up finding you? Could you describe us a, a typical user journey that they go through in order yeah. to get started with Inkit? So a lot of them find us through search, just like just like your product. So users will come across us either through 
our blog or at a trade conference or an event. Mm -hmm. And much of our traffic is actually derived through our form fields on our website. Yep. So we, we again have people that hit our website and our hope is to get them to convert into a, a demo. Yep. And then we take it from there, from a sales side. Very, very cool. So you mentioned the website there. What role would you say does the website play in um, you know, that oval, oval sort of system and that you've set up there? The website is a very, very big piece of the overall system. So the website houses both the blog, it also tells the brand story about our product mm -hmm. and who we are as a brand and what we're striving to be. And it also provides information and details on the services that we offer. So it's, it's, a, it's a very, very big component. And of course, our, our KPI is first and foremost, driving people to enter their information and then essentially hit that submit button. Yeah. So I was I was about to ask you because I've been speaking now with a lot of SaaS founders. I was so curious what types of metrics do you actually care about on the website, right? Because there's tons of metrics you could look sure. at. Sure. What is the ones that you drive your decisions by? So we constantly are monitoring our page views. So we're looking to make sure that our traffic is going up and to the right every month. Mm -hmm. Meaning we want to grow eyeballs on our site from both an awareness as well as just a traffic perspective. But ultimately that traffic is meaningless if it's not converting. So at the end of the day, the, the short answer is, is the one metric that really matters the most is the, the demo metric. Mm -hmm. Now we also do measure sub metrics on the demo side, such as you know, what those quality of leads are. And we start to tear it out even further because we know that some channels have higher quality leads than than others. Yep, makes total makes total sense. I'm curious if you have um, maybe a war story or a learning to share on how you were trying to improve this conversion metric on the demos. Anything you you've been trying? Anything you learned throughout the way that um, helped you to increase uh, the demo center? Yeah. So so one of the war stories we've learned is number one, always test your demo page. We had a period of time. It was when we were first getting going where our demo page was broken for about three days. Oh, wow. And we now know to, to always test the demo page before you, before you put it live. Yep. So that that's our first recommendation. Our, our second recommendation is we, we actually are very interested in starting to enrich our demo information, meaning if a new demo comes in through our form field, we are working on this as a Q1 2020 initiative, but basically taking that, that demo submission and then enriching that person's email name with additional data points so that we can already start to filter that lead as you know a priority lead and basically lead score them and assign those to the proper reps and teams. Makes a lot of sense. What types of information you think would be, if you zoom forward to the end of this project, what types of information would you like to see surrounding the leads? So we'd like to see things like Alexa rank. Mm -hmm. We'd like to see things like their employee count. We'd like to see things like their location because that helps us route to the proper proper teams. Yep. We also would like to see things like their intended volume or even their sector because we know that some sectors send have different needs than than other sectors. So there's there's quite a few different data points that we're we're interested in gaining from that lead form. Very very interesting. It sounds really cool. Um, so it seems like that conversion rates is a relatively important metric for you guys. So thanks a lot for sharing the, the stories minutes. on how you were trying to to uh, get that up and running. Um, any more challenges you faced uh, or learnings you got by improving the conversion rate? Anything else you could think about? As far as how to optimize the conversion rate, per se? Yep, from, yep, from, your, from your guys' experience. We were very big on the idea of brand. Mm -hmm. So one of our big initiatives is streamlining our brand and really telling this brand story because ultimately people buy from brands that they love 
And there's a reason people buy or still buy from Adidas and recognize the three stripes and will choose Adidas over a Chinese Alibaba knockoff. And so one of the big things that we're very, very big on is building this, this, this really, really powerful brand and ethos. And one of the leaders in that space, I believe, is a company called Asana. And when people think of Asana, they think of this really fun, this really playful brand. And Asana is able to infuse things like unicorns and rainbows and cats and all of these very fun, playful things. Mm -hmm. And we ultimately want users to have that same type of experience with our brand. And streamlining that message from both the application to the marketing side is is a huge initiative and priority of ours that we believe will ultimately lead to more conversions as well as stronger conversions and brand recognition and recall rates. So, Very interesting. Could you maybe share a little bit on that? Because that's super interesting. How would you have sort of gotten from, you know, this is the idea for the brand, this is the vision of our brand to actually executing that and distributing that across the different teams? Like what was your path uh, about that? Yeah, so when we when we had those conversations, we actually this is a little bit different than a lot of companies. We actually kept those conversations really tiny to a small group of people. We we know that the more people that get involved, sure, it might be more of a democratic or a democracy type of decision. But our brand, if if it, if it's if there's too many too many cooks in the kitchen per se, then it's it's going to be all things to all people, and and we really want it to be you know, just the vision of, 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 you know, the, the creative types. Mm -hmm. So, so we had a few people who actually outlined where we wanted to go with it. We also spent a lot of time looking at companies who, who have done it really well and who is, who we aspire to be like. And then we've since, you know, gone back and actually worked up our whole brand guidelines as well as specs and are really in the process of going, you know, front to back in terms of, rebranding a lot of those things to make sure that you have that consistency across the product. So just like just like Adidas has three stripes, not two stripes, yeah. we we are going for that same type of same type of brand and experience. Very very cool. Nice. Um I would love to switch gears a little bit now and learn a bit more about you as a, a founder and business owner. Um maybe if you could just tell me a little bit about what has helped you most to build up the business as uh, you have it there today? Oh boy. <laughs> the, the most important thing that has helped us build this business was likely playing a lot of, lot of sports growing up. Okay. And I liken business to a sport from the standpoint of you number one, have to train incredibly, incredibly hard. So when you look at the best athletes in the world, like Cristiano Ronaldo or a LeBron James, those guys are training day in and day out to be the very, very best. And they don't stop until, you know, they're, they're basically dead. They're going to keep, keep going. So, so, so that type of mentality is very important because, in order to build, in order to just get the business off the ground, but in order to build a great business and a, and to be the best business, you have to continue putting in the time and the energy and the dedication, just yeah. just like an athlete. But then it's also really important, to just like an athlete, to be able to kind of ebb and flow with the ups and downs. So there are you know days where you might lose a match, and there are days in business where you might you know have a have a bug or an outage or something that goes wrong and you have to be able to just sort of roll with things and just see that things are constantly going up and up in the long run. So that's, that would say, I'd say that'd be my biggest learning or the biggest, you know, help per se. Makes a lot of sense. And if you then would sort of zoom back into the early days where you have to have that consistency that you were just describing in that early days, how did you get that first 10 customers? Oh my gosh. Straight hustle. (laughs) email so, calling what was it i i would say that the first the first 10 customers and even you know past that was as i'd call it like hand to hand combat mm-hmm. from the standpoint of 
you didn't, you know, we didn't have a, we didn't even have a brand then, right? We didn't have a, we didn't have a, nobody knew who we were. We weren't recognized. We were more or less unknown. So we literally were knocking on business doors. We were cold calling people. We were going through friends and family connections. We were going to trade shows to try to find people who might buy from us. Yep. And so the first 10 customers, the first customer was the hardest customer. The second customer was the second hardest. And then the next 10 were the next 10 hardest. So it, 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 um, it got a little bit easier, but it was a lot of hand to hand combat. Makes a lot of sense. And that was you, you personally, was it a small team back then? Well, how should we imagine back, that situation? Back then it was just me. <laughs> very cool. So a very lot cool. of hand to hand combat personally, I guess. Awesome. Awesome. Very nice. If you would go back into those days where you started off uh, by yourself, then uh, doing that combat, as you were just mentioning it, sure. um, what would be one advice that you would give yourself? Of things I would have done differently or just of... Uh, yeah. Lo looking back now, would you probably what you've done differently. Maybe you would just tell yourself, do it exactly the same way, then no. But just in general, like what would be one advice that you would give yourself to the time? One, one advice I would have done different. One of the things I would have done differently is I would have spent more time mapping out the different markets that we sh should have gone after. Mm -hmm. So, and, and, and I guess in, in retrospect too, in all fairness, we didn't, we didn't know who our buyer was. And so we, we probably needed to go knock on doors and make calls anyways. Yep. But if we had spent a little bit more time taking our wish list of clients and then mapping out the similarities between our, our wish list, probably would have saved ourselves two or three months of just hard work of phone calls because we would have found more commonalities. Yep. So being strategic, sometimes it's not how hard you work, it's how smart you work. Obviously you need both, but I think if we had been a little bit smarter, that hard work would have, would have you know, paid off a little bit quicker per Very se. Cool. Very cool. Yeah, so thanks a lot, Michael, for sharing uh, about your company today for sharing about how you're thinking about growth and your your strategy around that and then also sharing from the early days on how you sort of build up the business from the very very ground by yourself uh, fighting your way through until you know it became the company that it is today so thanks for being part of the show today yeah thanks lucas thanks for having me appreciate it